All right. Welcome, everyone. Nice to see you. It's February already. <laughs> exactly. Um, so this is the Robert Lyons Group of the Sierra Club. We've been in the Charleston area for a long time, <laughs> uh, probably 40 plus years. Uh, we've got over 1,400 members in Berkeley, Charleston, Dorchester, and Colleton counties. And um, we've added something new to our welcome slide. And um, let me get this out of the way so I can see it. Um, so we're on the traditional lands of the Ashpu, Awadaw, Siwi, Bohicket, Catawba, Combahee, Com Kusa, uh, Edisto, Ituan, Kiowa, PD, Shem, Stono, Wando, Wafu, Wamas, Wasamasa, Wasamasa, yeah, and Winya nations. Um, so, you know, it's four counties, and these tribes overlapped um, their areas, and we're here at various times. So, um, there is a map out there where um, it's online, and you can go figure this out for any place in the United States. Okay. Um, so our volunteer leadership, I'm Christine Von Collins. I'm the chair of the local group. Uh, let's see, we've got some, uh, Pat is here. She's our membership chair. And um, Ina, she puts our programs together. So thank you. Star is online and he um, runs the Zoom from home. He does our website. He's our outings leader chair. Uh, he does other social media for us. Um, and uh, Laura is at home. Um, she is our publicity chair. Alec does our newsletter. Uh, so um, is Jean in the audience? She may be online. Um, she is our treasurer. Uh, so um, thank you all. And if you wanna be a volunteer, come on. Um, we've got positions open. We've got general position on the XCOM meet, um, committee. We, um, you know, we're going into a very, very heightened political season. Um, if you're interested in politics, uh, let us know. And um, we could use a co conservation chair. All right, outings. Star is going to unmute himself at home and talk about the outings. Well, I'm going to start off by saying that this weekend, Amanda Vogus is going to do something. So Amanda, do you want to tell everybody about this? Um, yeah, sure. So this Saturday is the 17th annual Francis Marion National Forest Cleanup. Um, so I decided I'm going to go do this and I would love to have some other Sierra Club uh, members join me. It's a lot of fun. We kind of all split up and tackle different areas around the National Forest to pick up any trash and litter along the highway or those side streets. Um, and yeah, I'll be there at the sign-in table. Uh, the address is on the Palmetto Pride um, website, but we also shared it on Meetup Facebook um, and Campfire as well. Uh, so I'll be wearing a Black Sierra uh, Club hat and be standing by this, the sign-in table. We can just group together and divide and conquer. Thanks, Amanda. Amanda's one of our new outings leaders, and I'll keep saying that for the next 15 years. Um, uh, next weekend, not this coming weekend, but the next weekend, we're, we're going to have sort of a camp out at the Santee Coastal Reserve, one of the most important birding areas on the East Coast and, a, and an absolutely beautiful place to experience in winter. Um, and we're going to take a couple of different hikes on Saturday afternoon. Uh, we're going to do maybe the uh, green trail and possibly part of the red trail and possibly go up and look at, at the um, ruins of, uh, oh, what's that, El Dorado. Um, and then on Sunday, we'll mostly spend the day doing the uh, the uh, Cape Trail. Um, Bill Turner will take you, uh, this is an overnight camping trip, but if you want to come, the, the Sandy Coastal Reserve is an overnight camping trip. If you want to come up Saturday and spend the night till Sunday morning, that's fine. If you want to come up Saturday or if you want to come up Sunday, that's okay too. Details to be revealed um, on, on Campfire. Um, Bill Turner's leading a hike 
That's the Donnelly Wildlife Management Area, another outstandingly beautiful place for uh, all of you to come out and visit. Uh, both of these hiking experiences are basically over flat ground. So if you can walk a few miles, you'll probably be just fine. Um, our oyster roast is coming up. Somebody else will talk about that later. And we've got stuff all the way through March and into the summer and great outings over and over and over again. So watch and be amazed and join us. Thank you, Amanda and Star. Who's going to Santee Coast Reserve? Woo! All right. <laughs> Paul, you're not gonna go? <laughs> I don't know. All right. Let me see if I can get this thing to work here. Get this one out of the way now. Okay. All right. Um, we have our oyster roast coming up. And I know I've seen a lot of you in this audience there. So you know how good the oysters are at Bowen's Island. Um, so come out and join us. Uh, we have um, tickets available. Uh, you can go to the Robert Lunds Group uh, Sierra Club website and it's on Eventbrite. So um, buy tickets ahead of time and or buy them at the door. Um, we're going to have Ben and Jerry's ice cream. We'll have veggie dogs that we have um, pre-checked that they're good. <laughs> we did a taste test so we know that they're good veggie dogs. Um, we'll have chili and lime and the coconuts will be playing some good tunes for us. So um, we've also, we'll also have a lot of auction items. So come on out and have fun. Nope, back. All right. Um, there is going to be a Gadsden Creek panel discussion. Uh, this is another organization that's putting this on and they've asked us to let you know about it. It's called Reimagining the Gadsden Creek Community, Daylighting the Science. Uh, it will be at Burke High School Auditorium February 8th. That's this kind of, um, next Thursday at 6 p.m. So uh, if you're interested in finding out what's going on with Gadsden Creek and um, their effort to try to save it, uh, come on out and, and learn more about that. All right, um, Dr. Bosnecker, come on up. Yeah, a quick announcement. Yeah, very quick announcement. Uh, I'm Dr. Bosnecker, paleontologist. I used to work here actually until last year. Uh, we just started up our new paleontological nonprofit, the Charleston Center for Paleontology. We were invited by Mr. Bill Turner in the back there. He used to volunteer for us at the museum before COVID, um, and he's thinking about doing it again. We're looking for more volunteers. So if you're interested in helping uh, pick little tiny shark and ray teeth out of matrix, put fossil whales and dolphins back together, uh, either by gluing or uh, cleaning off like limestone off their bones and teeth. Um, we're actually going out and digging up new fossils uh, on our property out uh, west of Somerville. Um, please contact us, team at charlestoncenterforpaleo.org. Um, and, uh, I, you know, we need help. <laughs> so, uh, which is always my plea at uh, Mace Brown Museum. So anyway, um, Glad to introduce us and uh, let us know. Then we make an outing. <laughs> you hear that, outing leaders? Okay. Um, we have call to actions every month uh, for conservation. So we uh, definitely, when you mitigate, adapt, and you are resilient to the climate crisis, um, one of the things you're doing is um, reducing your use of fossil fuels. So um, if, you, if you have a home um, of your own and you want to weatherize um, and do some um, home repair to that, uh, here's, the, here's some um, resources for that. We've got um, Brian Cordell at the Sustainability Institute. They have a lot on their website, but you can also contact them for more information on weatherization. They actually, um, many years ago now, they came to um, our home and, um, just went up and down and all around our house. Uh, they did this thing called a blower door test and um, they found that uh, the air ducts were leaking in our house. So um, we had another contractor come in and fix them and we saved a lot of money and a lot of energy. So um, it, you could be wasting money that you don't even know. Uh, and um, we've got the federal government, they've got the Investment Reduction Act right now. They're giving away lots of money 
Um, if you want solar on your house, if you want to put in a um, heat pump water heater, which is a really cool water heater that draws heat from the air, even in winter, and it, um, it turns that heat from the air into hot water. So uh, let's see, what else can you do? You can do all sorts of lighting in your house, um, appliances. They, um, they give you uh, incentives to do all of this. And Dominion Energy also gives incentives to do all this. So you could actually um, get the tax rebates and the Dominion incentives and pay a lot less than you think you're gonna pay. So look into it um, and see what you can get done. That out of the way. All right, voting season is upon us. Uh, actually, Saturday, is it Saturday, February 3rd, is the um, South Carolina Democratic presidential primary. Um, that's very soon. And the Republican presidential primary is Saturday, February 24th. So get out there and vote. Um, all right. Before we get to this um, month's program, we're going to talk about next month's program, just to let you know. Uh, all over the low country, there are septic tanks. Um, a lot of them are being taken out because they really do um, leak and cause problems, and they get into the local waterways and cause problems. And there are developers that are developing larger um, communities that they want to put septic tanks in, new ones. So we already know these things cause problems. So why do we want more of them? So Leslie Lenhart from um, the South Carolina Environmental Law Project is gonna come and talk to us about that and explain what's going on and what can be done about it. Okay, Dr. Richard Hall is here. Um, so uh, he is the Associate Professor of Ecology at the University of Georgia and a board member of the company Rivers Audubon Society. And um, we had dinner, he's a great guy. Uh, he's he knows his birds. <laughs> he, he already answered a lot of my questions, so welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. I'm going to get rid of this one. Switch over some presentations. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, while we're loading up the presentation, um, I'll acknowledge that uh, Athens is on the, the land of the uh, Cherokee and Creek people, so um, that's where my, my yard is situated, and uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit today about my, my journey, my adventures and misadventures in trying to create uh, a wildlife-friendly and bird-friendly yard. All right. There we go. Everyone hear me okay at the back? And if you have a question at home, put it on the chat and we will get to it at the end. Thank you. Great. Oh, and if you're at home, turn your screen off. It saves energy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, uh, as you might guess, uh, even though I'm from, I live in Athens, Georgia now, I'm from the South, but not from the American South. I'm, uh, for, I grew up close to, to London uh, in an era where uh, we used to wear clothes like this that came back into fashion with the Barbie movie this, uh, this last year. Um, but from a, you know, from a very young age, I've always been uh, really fascinated by uh, birds. And uh, luckily through my career, I uh, ended up via a math degree and uh, en ended up in an ecology school um, at the University of Georgia. And uh, part of my work now uh, involves studying bird migration and uh, interactions of birds of, and, and parasites. So I, I managed to kind of uh, turn my boyhood passion into a, a part of my job, which is, which is very gratifying. So, so I moved to Athens in 2009 and uh, a year later found myself for the first time in my life uh, able to uh, buy a house. And I thought, you know, I really want to attract lots of birds to, to my yard. So uh, there's lots of reasons for, for doing this. On the, on the conservation side, some of you may know that uh, birds are undergoing uh, pretty precipitous declines. It's been estimated that we've lost about one in four of all North American birds since the, the, the 1970s. And so there's lots of things that we can do to uh, bring them back, uh, which includes, of course, restoring and maintaining uh, habitat. 
And even around our yards, we can, uh, we can do this. Even on very small scales, if we all do this collectively, uh, we can create quite a lot of uh, bird and wildlife friendly habitat. But creating, uh, attracting birds to your yard and creating habitat for birds isn't just good for the birds, it's good for us too. Increasingly, there's been a lot of social science studies showing that uh, birds are pretty good for our well-being. So uh, in Europe, uh, uh, studies have found that more bird species close to where people live uh, increases people's uh, life satisfaction as much as a, as a higher income. And um, there was a recent study that used smart smartphones to sort of track uh, people's emotional state and mental well-being. And um, they heard that uh, they found that seeing or hearing birds improved people's mental well-being for up to eight hours. So, uh, you know, who needs Viagra? Um, but, um, you know, birds are... Um, birds really came into sharp focus, I think, in the early pandemic when a lot of people were... Uh, primarily staying home or just taking walks in their neighborhood, I think suddenly a lot of people started paying attention to all the, the wildlife we have around our, uh, our home. So it became increasingly uh, popular. This was true of my niece. Uh, uh, that's my niece back in the UK. And I thought she did a pretty great uh, drawing of this uh, Eurasian robin uh, that was uh, in my grandparents' yard. So um, if you want to attract birds, uh, native plants are a, a really good idea. And one of the reasons for this is that, that many of uh, our, our songbirds, um, even if you see them in different seasons, eating, um, eating seeds at a feeder, um, things like chickadees, um, in the summer, they really want to feed caterpillars um, to their uh, offspring. And they really need many thousands of, of caterpillars to um, uh, successfully raise young. So birds like eastern bluebirds um, and these cute little eastern phoebe babies kind of lined up uh, back to front there, uh, they, they really uh, need to have caterpillars for their uh, development and uh, early survival. And if you want to have caterpillars and lots of them, um, then you need to have food plants that caterpillars can feed on. And uh, we all know plants uh, have evolved a, a bunch of defenses against herbivory, um, but uh, native plants and native caterpillars sort of co-evolve uh, so there are usually caterpillars that can um, overcome the defenses of these of these plants and non-native exotic plants, even though they can provide um, nectar for um, uh, adult butterflies um, and, and moths, uh, they're not necessarily suitable as, um, as breeding grounds. So no native plants, you're not going to have many caterpillars uh, and, and as a result, you're not going to see as, as many birds. I uh, thought I'd do a quick uh, uh, quiz here. Um, who, who can name the, the caterpillar and the, uh, the plant association? Monarch. Monarch butterflies, and they eat? Milkweeds. Milkweeds, yep. Yeah. Uh, so there's, a, there's an adult uh, nectaring on some blue mist. Uh, what about this caterpillar? Yep, yeah. it's a black swallowtail. And uh, they, they, eat many, they eat many things in the, in the parsley family. Uh, this was on a, on a plant called uh, wild parsnip or, or, or zizia. Uh, another native plant. Uh, here's a bit of a head scratcher. I, I didn't know which one this is. Does anyone recognize this caterpillar? Kind of looks like the very hungry caterpillar from the kids' books. It's, um, it's a long-tailed skipper, uh, and it was on a, on a plant called Desmodium or tick trefoil um, uh, in, in my yard there. So um, someone actually quantified that there was a study done by uh, Desiree Narango um, in DC, uh, metropolitan DC area, and um, she tracked the fate of chickadee nests um, in urban backyards in this area, and she quantified things like nest success, nest pro productivity, um, in relation to the proportion cover of native plants. And her findings showed that chickadee populations were being maintained or growing in yards that had at least 70% uh, native vegetation. So if you want to have persistent populations of birds like uh, chickadees, then we should really be aiming to kind of ramp up the uh, proportion of native plants uh, in, in our yards. So I'm hoping I can convince you today that um, a well-designed backyard, even a very small one, um, can provide year-round interest uh, for birds from uh, res year-round residents like northern cardinals that might be eating insects like this, uh, this moth in the summer and switching over to seeds more in the, in, in the winter. 
uh, to, to winter visitors like uh, these fruit eating uh, cedar wax wings. Um, we talked about this at dinner. This is a bird that likes to um, hang around in, in, in groups. It's a very social bird. Uh, to summer breeders and in the Piedmont region of, um, of Georgia, we're lucky to have birds like um, wood thrush and summer tanager that breed with us. But we also, uh, our yards can also serve as way stations for birds on much longer journeys. So uh, these migratory warblers, many of which spent the winter in Central or South America uh, and might be going as far as the Appalachians or might be going all the way up to the boreal forests of uh, Canada to spend the summer. And they'll readily stop over in a yard that provides insects for them. Um, so, so, so this is my yard. Um, and, uh, you know, I arrived here from the UK. I didn't really know any of my plants when I when I first moved here. Uh, but when I bought the house, I thought this, you know, this has trees. It's got canopy complexity. So it's probably going to be good for birds. So I called in a friend who was a landscape architect and I said, would you mind walking around the, uh, the yard with me and just telling me, you know, what what are the good plants that I should keep? And, uh, you know, what, what are the uh, invasives that I should I should probably be getting rid of? And we wandered around the yard um, and my friend uh, didn't say anything. Um, and it turned out uh, I, I had the full suite of kind of classic invasives we see in the southeast from English ivy to uh, bamboo to Chinese privet to Japanese honeysuckle to wisteria to Eliagnus. Um, in fact, she said the only thing I could keep were the water oaks. <laughs> so, you know, I thought, well, this is good. I've got a blank canvas. I can I can design my yard from the from the ground up. Um, so how do I find out about native plants? Luckily, there's a lot of uh, really great, uh, easy online uh, resources. If you're looking for bird and wildlife fr uh, uh, friendly plants, uh, I'd recommend looking at the website Plants for Birds. Just Google Plants for Birds. It takes you to this website uh, in that drop down menu in the bottom left there. Um, you can uh, enter your email address to get in contact with them, or you can punch in your zip code. And uh, I punched in a zip code for sort of Charleston area, and it told us that the nearest Audubon Society that might uh, offer native plant services is the uh, Charleston Audubon Charleston Natural History Society. And it comes up with a list of plants that are native to this area, and it tells you a little bit about, um, you know, their sun and water needs, um, whether they produce fruit or flowers, and what kinds of wildlife um, they support. So uh, Plants for Birds is a really good uh, resource for finding out what might work well in your in your local area. Another thing you can do is various organizations. Uh, so in Georgia, our various chapters of Audubon will do this, but the National Wildlife Federation has this too. Uh, there are various organizations um, where you can get your yard certified. And um, with, our, with our Audubon program in Georgia, uh, we, we have a couple of uh, people that know their native plants really well will sort of tour your yard and give you advice on uh, how to improve it for wildlife. And at the end of this process, you get a, a little uh, certificate or sign like this. And um, these signs are a great idea, not, not for bragging rights, but what I've found is um, I, I've got my uh, uh, Georgia Audubon sign sort of posted uh, out, outside my house. And I think what it does is it signals to people that, you know, my, my front yard uh, to some people might look a little uh, overgrown a little less formal, a little less curated than a lawn. And I think what these signs do, are, are they kind of indicate that this is intentional, that this is for supporting uh, wildlife. And it gets kind of people interested in this idea. How do I get my yard certified as a wildlife sanctuary? So hopefully uh, it becomes contagious. Um, there's a lot of uh, native plant nurseries uh, around. Um, I just briefly looked for some in the uh, in the Charleston area, and I came up with Roots and Shoots Nursery that seemed to be a primarily native nursery. But there are also um, organizations that will organize um, native plant sales, like the South Carolina Native Plant uh, Society. Um, or you might find informally gardening clubs will do seed swaps and, and, and such. But spring and fall are great times to uh, plant these, uh, these native plants. Um, so, you know, be looking out for those uh, in the coming months. Uh, so I went to a native plant sale and, and I got pretty carried away. So went to this sale and completely full, uh, filled my, my tiny car with plants um, and got them all home. And, you know, it just looked like a drop in an ocean. So, of course, I went straight back and uh, <laughs> got a whole lot more plants. So now I had uh, a reasonable number of plants and I went to break ground and uh, I learned my, my first lesson about gardening. 
in the in the Georgia Piedmont, uh, we have slightly different soil from here. You have lovely, nice, soft, sandy soil. We have hard red clay. This is October, which was a very dry month. Uh, so I bought all these plants. I went to break ground, and I don't think I got half an inch into that into that dirt. Um, so uh, I should have listened to the wisdom of the Phoebe, and uh, I should have started small and learned a little bit about my soil type. And um, if you live in a sort of challenging soil environment like the the Georgia Piedmont, um, creating raised beds is your is is your friend. So uh, start small. So if you want to create a yard that's really attractive to birds, um, you really want to think about all the things that a bird would need. Um, so they not only need um, different kinds of food depending on their on their diet type. Um, but birds need water to, to drink, but also to bathe. Feather maintenance is really important. Uh, they'll need shelter from uh, extreme weather um, and also from predators. And they'll need structures that are suitable for them to build uh, nesting sites. So I'm going to go through um, in, in the next sort of 10 minutes or so, I'm going to give you some examples of native plants that have worked pretty well in, um, in, in my yard. Um, not all of those are necessarily going to work in the Charleston area because we're in a slightly different growing re uh, region. Many of them will. But the idea is that you, you'll want to kind of uh, create a mix of um, structures, sizes and structures of plants. The more diversity of um, flowering plants, kind of woody shrubs, mid-sized trees you have, uh, the more diverse the collection of birds you're going to um, uh, get. So um, what, I, yeah, what I really want to urge you to do is try and think about making your yard as 3D as possible. Um, this lawn looks very nice and very neat, um, but it's, it's pretty much a monoculture and only a small um, subset of birds are able to use uh, that structure. So mixes of, of vegetation are gonna support the highest diversity of insects and therefore birds. Uh, so uh, a wildlife friendly yard might have a structure more like this, where you can still make it look very intentional by, by creating beds that are bordered with areas of, of, of lawns. You don't have to eradicate all of, all of your lawn if you like your lawn, but you can, you can use it as a tool to kind of uh, showcase uh, flower beds. And again, having these structures of kind of uh, mid-sized shrubs um, and smaller trees and even large trees if you, if you have the, the space in your yard. Um, and features like uh, uh, rock piles and um, water bodies will also enhance the biodiversity value of your, of your yard. So I'm gonna go through a few different kind of types of birds that we might hear, see here in the, in, the, in the Southeastern US and the kinds of food that they like. So um, in the winter, um, you might see large roving flocks of um, black birds. Um, and these can be things like common grackles. Sometimes we have flocks of um, thousands of common grackles in the, um, in, in the Athens area, and they're seed eaters. They've got large, powerful bills, so they can actually crush acorns with their bills. If you're very lucky, you might get birds like this uh, rusty blackbird, which is a, a species that's undergone 90% declines um, uh, throughout, throughout its uh, breeding range. But we have quite a lot of them wintering here in the southeast, and they really like to eat um, um, pecans. And I found that uh, they, they also like to cheat. So we have pecan trees overhanging our road, and they wait till the cars have run over them. And so uh, there's some ready-made trail mix uh, for, for them. Um, a sign that birds like to eat seeds, uh, birds like finches and sparrows uh, eat, a, eat a lot of seeds. And so they tend to have conical bills, like pretty fat bills at the base, um, not very long and pointed, which is typical of a, an, an insect eater. And American goldfinches are, are pretty unique in that they really like to eat seeds year round, including feeding seeds to their young. They actually breed a little bit later uh, than a lot of other uh, songbirds that are trying to keep track of insect emergence. These birds are actually uh, timing their reproduction around the time that a lot of uh, flowers like um, cone flowers or black-eyed Susans might be, uh, might be setting seed. And um, importantly, um, I think you'll see this when you see some pictures of my yard, um, a, wild, a wildlife friendly yard, um, it's okay if at least in places you leave it um, a little bit messy, it's intentional. And so um, once your coneflowers and your black eyed Susans have gone to seed, um, don't deadhead them immediately. Leave at least some of those seed heads around because birds will use those seed heads throughout the winter. 
This is a bird called a pine siskin. They come down um, to our area in variable numbers from year to year. Some years there's hardly any, some years they'll show up in their, in their hundreds. And in one of these big invasion years of siskins, um, about a hundred of them descended on my yard and, and completely um, demolished uh, the remaining uh, uh, coneflower seeds. But these birds were, were hungry and these, these seeds were able to sustain them through the winter. And I even sometimes, even though I live in a very wooded area in the middle of town, I'll sometimes get open country birds like uh, savannah sparrows, which are more kind of birds of, um, of fields, or you might see them here in, in marshes. Um, but one of them on migration uh, again found my yard and was very happy sort of chowing down on, on coneflower seeds. A favorite bird of a, a lot of gardeners uh, here in the, in the US is uh, uh, the hummingbird. Uh, we, we just have one breeding species of hummingbird in the eastern, eastern U.S., uh, ruby-throated hummingbirds. And um, what I like to do is try and um, make sure that there are, are, are plants that hummingbirds like to feed on from the time they uh, arrive until they depart for their um, full migration. Um, so they can be supported through the, the whole season. A good clue that a plant is a hummingbird plant is that they're often red in color and they're long and tubular. Um, so hummingbirds have co-evolutionary relationships with a lot of these plants where uh, the hummingbird uh, sticks its bill into this, uh, in this case, a columbine, and there's usually some structure where uh, pollen will be deposited onto the, the forehead of the hummingbird. So as it moves around these uh, plants, it's gonna be depositing pollen as it goes. So in, in Athens, columbines get going in, in, in early March, right as the hummingbirds are, go, uh, are coming back. And this plant on the right is Indian pink, which is a, a plant in Athens that flowers in, in, in April and can again in the, in, in the summer, in the middle of June. My, my favorite summer plant for these is the, is the scarlet bee balm. And I, I start to see a lot of baby hummingbirds. Uh, this is a young male with just a, a little hint of his ruby throat uh, to come. And you can see the, the bird on the right uh, looks like it's got a golden forehead. And again, that's because it's been visiting lots of plants and uh, picking up lots of, uh, lots of pollen. In the fall, cardinal flower is a, is, a, is a great flower. And one of my favorites is coral honeysuckle, um, which will grow here at the coast as well. Um, in mild winters, it will stay green through the winter and um, can have flowers on it uh, pretty much in, in any season. So can support uh, your ruby-throated hummingbirds uh, the whole time that they're here. I told you we only have one breeding hummingbird, but um, increasingly, um, I think as a consequence of both um, climate warming and also um, uh, warmer, warmer winters that mean that there's insects available um, all through the winter and lots of flowering plants in the winter, um, we'll occasionally see um, hummingbirds show up uh, in, in the winter in, in Georgia. Um, and one year I had uh, two show up all at once, this little black chinned hummingbird on the left and a, a female rufous hummingbird on the, on, on the right. So we're seeing these birds um, in, increasingly. Um, and, you know, I, I put out a hummingbird feeder in the, in the winter, um, but hummingbirds don't just feed on, on flowers. They, they need protein too. So they, um, they, they need to eat insects. That needs to be part of their diet. And what I found was that these, uh, my, my native plants, like the, um, uh, the, the stems, the, the dead stems of the coneflowers that I'd left in place, uh, the hummingbirds really like to perch on these. They sheltered from them in, in kind of cold winter weather. Um, and they also served as places that the hummingbirds would be foraging and gleaning for uh, insects all through the winter. A lot of birds like to eat fruit, especially during migration. It really helps power migration. And um, so a few of my, uh, and different plants uh, are gonna produce fruit in different seasons. Um, in the spring and the summer, things like uh, red mulberry and blueberry, as well as, well as cherries and elderberries, are great choices for um, birds like seed, seed or wax wings as they're heading back north. Uh, red mulberries are a real favorite with birds like rose-breasted grosbeaks and, and, and yellow-breasted chats. Um, and you might end up seeing scenes like this. This bird is called a red-eyed vireo. Uh, it looks like it's a, a, a murderer, um, but uh, all, all of this staining here is that the, uh, the vireo, even though it's primarily insect eater, on migration they'll, they'll fatten up on fruits like red mulberries um, and end up sort of uh, looking uh, pretty grisly as a result of that. 
In the fall, one of my favorite uh, bird plants is called Devil's Walking Stick, uh, so named because it's, uh, it's got a woody stem that's covered in uh, sharp thorns. But it also produces a, a show of white flowers in the late summer when not much else is flowering. And uh, so it's always covered in swallowtail butterflies and bees. But after those flowers are done, it produces these small purplish uh, elder elderberry-like uh, berries that are very popular with birds like uh, mockingbirds. And uh, there's a brown thrasher waiting in the wings for that mockingbird to finish up. Um, as well as some birds that just migrate through our region on their way to the tropics, like the, the Swainson's thrush. So if you want to feed uh, insectivorous birds, uh, it turns out not all, not all native plants are equal in the abundance and diversity of caterpillars they support. So um, some trees are really uh, caterpillar superfoods. They, they support uh, really diverse uh, kinds of caterpillars uh, through multiple different seasons. And so, uh, yeah, oaks in particular are going to be great if you want to attract warblers uh, like these northern perulas and chestnut-sided warblers, but also resident birds in our area like, uh, like Carolina wrens. Although a lot of uh, insect-eating birds like to forage in the treetops, there's another group of insectivorous birds that uh, are typically feeding below head height um, in sort of perennial flowering plants. So that would include birds like prairie warblers and Tennessee warblers. Uh, the prairie warblers breed with us, um, but Tennessee warblers and Nashville warblers are, are, are just migrating through. And they really love the golden rods in my yard, but they'll also use um, really anything in the aster family to glean caterpillars from. Uh, as they as they move through in in September, and then several species um, will only be foraging for insects on the ground. We've got three different species here, and maybe to an untrained eye, these these uh, these all look the same. You might be lamenting, "How will I ever get into birds? They they all look the same." Um, I think this is an example of, um, of of camouflage. So even though these birds aren't very closely related to each other, and they occur in our region in quite different seasons, so the hermit thrushes are only here in the winter, the oven birds are migrating through where our thrushes are here year round. I think that kind of brown plumage with the kind of speckled chest here um, blends in pretty well um, on a sort of dappled light of a, of, of a forest floor. But these birds are looking for insects on the ground primarily. And so, um, you know, a great place that insects like to hide, especially through the winter months, uh, is in leaf litter. Um, so, you know, please don't be overly tidy with your leaves or, or, you know, clear the places you want to clear of leaves, but maybe keep some leaf piles in your uh, yard rather than exporting them uh, somewhere else. Um, this leaf litter is, is full of um, overwintering uh, insects that support birds and turn into pollinators the following uh, season. And then similarly, these birds will readily forage in, in lawns, but um, they'll only uh, be successful in that foraging if there's uh, food for them there. So please go a little easy um, on, on the lawn care. And you know, it's okay to let some other species uh, grow into your lawn as well. I have some clover that pops up in mine, and that can be a good kind of early food source for the first emerging uh, bumblebees. So I mentioned as well as food, you should be thinking about what, what other habitat features that birds uh, might use. Uh, so uh, you can take uh, your yard litter, you know, if you have a big storm here and lots of branches fall, you can pile up all those branches to create what's called a brush pile. And um, these brush piles can be great places. Um, some birds will roost in them, some birds will glean uh, insects from the dead wood. Um, but especially they can be great for a bird to dart into if there's a predator around. So if you've got a pretty open space in your yard, creating a brush pile uh, creates a little escape hatch for a bird like this white-throated sparrow to um, zoom into if it sees um, a hawk or a, or a cat. If it is safe to do so, dead trees are extremely valuable for, for wildlife. Um, of course, it's not appropriate to do this in every setting, but if you have a tree that isn't going to threaten your property or your neighbor's property, uh, keeping as much of the tree as you can um, is going to provide uh, lots of different functions for birds. So um, it can act as a snag or a lookout post. If you look at the top of this dead tree um, that was in my front yard, it, is, it, it rotted away in, in the end. But at the very top of that, uh, there's a little dark blob. And... Uh, 
That turned out to be a Mississippi kite, so an insect-eating bird of prey. Um, they hunt dragonflies and cicadas, uh, large insects on the wing. And so they really like these um, tall, uh, dead uh, perches to kind of look for, look for prey. And um, these dead trees can also act as a scaffold for vines, uh, vines like Virginia creeper. And Virginia creeper is a really popular plant with migratory birds in the uh, in the fall. What we've got here is uh, two Swainson thrushes that breed up in Canada, winter down from uh, Mexico down to northern South America. Um, and they they ate every single one of my Virginia creeper berries. I think here you're seeing the, the very last Virginia creeper berry being uh, stolen away from a very indignant looking uh, Swainson thrush here. And the soft wood of, of dead snags is excellent for birds that um, excavate their, their nests, for cavity nesters. Birds like the brown-headed nuthatch, a tiny little bird that sounds like a kind of squeaky dog toy, um, that its entire uh, world range is in the southeastern US, and they rely on this soft wood to, to feed on. Um, if you don't have trees or it's not appropriate for you to have dead trees, you can, of course, um, mimic uh, dead tree uh, cavities by um, putting up a, a birdhouse. If you do mount one on a pole, I'd, I'd thoroughly re recommend putting a device halfway up here, like a squirrel baffle um, that can keep out rat snakes, uh, squirrels, or, or other potential nest usurpers and, and predators. Sorry, Gretchen, but you missed most of the talk. <laughs> um, so um, one thing, uh, so lots of different birds have different habitat requirements, different heights or vegetation they like to hang out in. But a great equalizer from the point of view of birds is water. Every bird needs water. Um, even if they're getting most of the water they need um, from, their, from their diets for, for, for drinking, uh, birds, feather maintenance is hugely important to birds. So they love to come in and, and bathe. And so um, putting in a water feature is going to attract the biggest sort of diversity of birds in your, in your yard. And um, ideally, if you have some mechanism uh, to get water moving in your yard, and this can be uh, something as simple as putting like a little uh, solar bubbler in a, in a kind of dish of water through to, in, in, in my yard, um, I went a bit fancier and I, I, um, I have a, a, a pond pump that circulates water uh, down an eight foot stream. And I think the uh, the sound and movement, um, uh, the, the light reflected from that water helps the birds uh, find it. And it's been a real magnet for, uh, for birds. The other advantage of moving water, of course, is that that can um, prevent mosquitoes breeding in it. And one of the biggest advantages is, um, if you've ever bought like a bird field guide or looked at a bird app, you'll see all these impossibly colored birds. Um, and the reality is often these birds are hidden up in the treetops, um, but birds will come down to the tree from the treetops. When water's scarce on the landscape, they'll come down to bathe. So birds like scarlet tanagers and these rose-breasted grosbeaks, um, as well as migratory thrushes like, like viris, will all come, uh, they're pretty secretive normally, but they'll all come uh, down to uh, drink and bathe. Um, and sometimes you'll even see very weird birds. Um, I was looking out of my yard one day and I thought that's a strange looking pigeon. I saw something that was about the size of a morning dove, but it didn't look quite right. Uh, it turned out this bird was a yellow-billed cuckoo. And the last place you imagine seeing a yellow-billed cuckoo is on the ground. Uh, they're very arboreal. They love to eat caterpillars. Um, even though they're about dove sized, they're, they're pretty hard to see. And this bird, um, in a dry period, uh, hopped right down uh, into the open uh, in a pond. And you'll sometimes even get larger birds like, uh, like Cooper's hawks. Um, even owls will come down to bathe in, in ponds. Um, and the biggest bird I ever had at my pond was a, was a great blue heron. And I always found myself wondering what that lump in its throat was. Um, did it find a frog or, or did one of my uh, yard cardinals get very unlucky? Some of the favorite birds of, of, of bird watchers are these groups called uh, the warblers. Uh, the North American warblers are a really diverse family. Uh, they sing beautiful songs and they have this dazzling array of colors. And again, if you, if you looked online or you looked in a field guide, you'll hear about birds like cerulean warbler. It's a gorgeous blue, you know, blue backed bird, uh, really glows in the right light. But when you go out in the field, Often this is your experience of a cerulean warbler. You're staring up against a backlit sky and you're just seeing the underside of this bird for a split second as it, as it flies off. 
Um, and this this kind of, uh, there's this phenomenon of birders that we spend so much of our time looking for warblers in the spring that there's a condition called warbler neck where uh, we end up with a crick in our neck from spending our whole time uh, staring up into the treetops. You put a pond in and warbler neck will be uh, a, a thing of the past. Uh, warblers in particular really seem very drawn to these water features. So in spring, I'll see uh, birds just uh, passing through the Athens area like Cape May warblers on their way to the boreal forests, red starts, hooded warblers. Later in the season, I might see birds like magnolia warblers and Canada and bay-breasted warblers. Some of those warblers going kind of about as far north as, um, as you can imagine into Canada uh, and Alaska. In the fall, some of these warblers have lost their breeding plumage, so they're not quite as boldly colored as the ones in the spring, but there's a lot more of them, and the water's even more attractive. Um, in, the, in the Athens area, I would guess this is true of Charleston too, um, October can be a pretty dry month, so the water is really attractive to these birds. So I start to see uh, not only one or two warblers, but sort of groups of warblers at a time. And some warblers that are really quite skulky that would ordinarily be quite difficult to see, like Connecticut warblers and Kentucky warblers. And uh, one October day, um, this was shot a couple of uh, falls ago now, but I looked out my window and there was just a constant stream of, of warblers uh, using my pond. So we have here a black and white warbler, a Tennessee warbler. Here's a Cape May warbler. Um, that was displaced by a Wilson's warbler, which was displaced by a bay-breasted warbler fighting off another Cape May warbler and a, a black-footed green warbler. It, it, you know, it was hard to keep track with the uh, number and diversity of, of, of birds that all came in over a period of just a, just a few hours. And all, all of these birds are just transiently using the, the yard. They're, they're hanging around for a uh, a day or two at most a week, uh, trying to refuel and, and fatten up before the next leap of their uh, migratory uh, journey. Uh, so uh, yeah, here we've got another warbler, the yellow-throated warbler that breeds here in Charleston, uh, being upstaged by Eastern bluebirds, which is always a, a really pretty bird. Uh, this bird doing its kind of fan dance here is a, a young or female American red star. The females or, or young have yellow tails. Here's a magnolia warbler. Uh, a northern perula, and yeah, yellow-throated vireo, uh, another bird that breeds in our area and migrates to the tropics. Uh, and then the mother load of northern cardinals came in. Um, we were starting to see the first of the winter visitors like ruby crown kinglet there. Uh, there's a very drab looking eastern toey on the right, uh, joined by a migratory Swainson's warbler. Uh, and grey catbirds, which which leave the Athens area in the winter, um, but in somewhere like Charleston would stay year round. Some of you might recognize that black and orange bird, um, Baltimore Orioles, although most of those go down to the tropics, um, places like Savannah and Charleston, these birds like to eat, um, uh, they'll eat grape jelly if you provide that for them, but they'll eat any kind of winter fruit, um, but also nectar. So they love feeding um, uh, camellia flowers. So definitely something to, to look out for in, in Charleston in the winter. So um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of uh, show you over, over a, a period of, I guess I've been in the house about 14 years now. Uh, this is what the backyard looked like uh, when I uh, got there. So I got rid of the invasives and I, I started to sort of build out little islands of habitat. And I tried to establish um, shrubs and small trees, things like uh, yorpon hollies, native uh, azaleas, sweet shrub, and so on, uh, to create some habitat structure. Um, and um, my, my pond is over there to the left of the, of, of the shed, so I can kind of sit in my screen porch and, and look down that stream at all the warblers. And you know, then I thought, Lawns are overrated, so uh, I shrunk the lawn uh, a, a good bit, and uh, just just this past fall, um, I've I've shrunk it even further and started to put a lot more of those like perennial uh, flowers in there. So you can see the yard is now very three D. So there's lots of different habitat structures and types that that birds will uh, will like to use, uh, and. Um, you know, hopefully in about a month from now, uh, this is what the backyard will look like. Uh, there's some spring ephemeral flowers um, in here, like a, like foam flower, and you can see the first flame azaleas just starting to, to bloom there. The front yard, um, you might call that a, a lawn. I had a pretty threadbare lawn when I first moved in. 
Um, and then some species like uh, Nandina or Heavenly Bamboo, which isn't really a great plant for wildlife. The, the berries contain trace, trace amounts of cyanide, so even though it's a pretty plant, um, uh, if birds ingest enough of them, it can it can be toxic to them. So um, I'd, I'd recommend replacing that plant if you, if you have it. So, you know, my front yard looked like every other one on my street, so it had a bit of a lawn. So I was a, a little bit nervous about how shrinking the lawn would appear. So I started doing that very piecemeal where I put in these raised beds um, and and sort of one raised bed at a time, I started shrinking the lawn until uh, a few years ago. Um, it completely disappeared um, into this um, profuse uh, prairie of, of, of wildflowers. So um, yeah, so uh, cone, cone flowers, uh, bee balms, um, uh, all, all sorts of um, summer flowers that uh, are really attractive to um, butterflies, bees and, and moths. Um, I did at this point think maybe, maybe I've gone too far. Um, so one, one thing I I've sort of started to do in more recent years, um, I wasn't a gardener by training. I didn't really know any of these plants. I wasn't really sure how tall they were going to get. Um, so, um, while I reveled in, in creating this jungle at first, what I've, what I've tried to do in the last couple of years is, is I've started moving those plants around. And so the plants closest to the road are gonna be things that grow no more than sort of knee height. Um, and I'm trying to create a more sort of layered, layered look. Um, so the tool, you know, I still let the plants, uh, you know, grow to their fullest potential in the backyard, but um, I do a little bit of trimming in the, uh, in, in the front, um, again, to sort of keep the, the neighbors um, on, on board with, uh, with this. And um, yeah, you know, learning about native plants uh, was interesting in itself. Um, I was kind of amazed at the response of the, you know, the number of birds I saw, the number of bees and butterflies I saw. Um, but, you know, you can also, as you start to learn your birds and start to observe them, uh, you can actually make that information go a lot further and help us paint a kind of nationwide picture of how birds are doing. There are a number of community science apps like eBird, um, or iNaturalist, um, where they have smartphone-based apps so you can record what you're, you're seeing um, in real time and submit those to databases that le let us know how bird numbers and bird distributions uh, are changing through time across seasons and years. Uh, in the winter, you can um, participate in Project Feeder Watch run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, and a really fun event, if you're just getting into your birding uh, and learning your birds, um, around, uh, usually around Valentine's Day, um, this year it's around February 17th to the 20th, um, is the Great Backyard Bird Count. So um, you can count birds wherever, the, wherever you are in your backyard, or even if you're out on uh, one of these really cool sounding field trips, you can submit your, your, your sightings. Um, and it's a really uh, good introduction to uh, interacting with these uh, community science projects. One thing I found pretty gratifying as, as someone who loves birds and, um, and, and studies birds as well uh, are the things that we learn. So uh, here's a, here's a great cheek thrush, a bird that breeds in Alaska, winters down in South America. Um, and it's pretty unusual in my yard. So I was very happy to see one. And um, if you look very closely at this picture, you might see on that leg, it's got a, a metal band uh, on it. Uh, so researchers, uh, We'll put these bands on birds in the hope that these birds will be recovered somewhere else or return to their breeding sites so we can estimate how long they live or, or where they go. So I thought, wow, this is good. I wonder if I can get close enough to read this band. So um, I, I tried to sneak up to this bird and I got all these photos that sort of look like hieroglyphics, but um, I, I looked at enough of these birds and I, I asked a few people to verify for me. I was able to read enough of the uh, band numbers on this bird to identify that that same bird had been seen, um, same individual bird had been caught and fitted with that band six weeks prior, 900 miles to the northeast in, in, in Connecticut. So I absolutely love that sort of connecting of the, of the dots and, and, you know, figuring how, how far and how fast these, these birds can move. This might not look like the most interesting bird you've ever seen, but to uh, bird watchers in Georgia, it turned out to be a very interesting bird. Uh, this is called a Bell's Vireo. This was actually the fifth record ever for Georgia 
Uh, and it showed up in my yard one fall and, and spent a whole nine uh, days there to the delight of people that were driving in from Savannah and Atlanta and all over to, uh, to see it. Um, this was uh, species number 152, um, the, the 152nd species of bird in my yard. And um, over the time I was there, it was really fun to watch this bird and study it. Um, it was gratifying as well to see that it was fully um, taking advantage of the buffet of all these native plants. So I saw it eating uh, caterpillars. In the middle, it's eating a ladybug, which probably didn't taste that great. Um, and then it was also eating berries of things like a uh, beauty berry and uh, that devil's walking stick. So it seemed like it found its way into the middle of um, middle of town in Athens, but then uh, stayed for the for the native buffet. So just to close out, um, I, I wanted you to think about when you you know when you're when you're developing your your backyard and thinking about the aesthetic. Um, we typically think about the vegetation structure, but you know you're not just growing plants; you're growing um, insects and birds um, and other wildlife that that will use your yard. So if you consider those, um, you know those those other elements of biodiversity, bir birds, pollinating insects, um, as as part of the aesthetic of your yard, um, then that's really useful for um, uh, helping you. Uh, decide uh, what you know what what kind of plants you need and what kind of structures that you that you need um, and again I'd like to sort of emphasize that um, if you want your yards to be uh, wildlife friendly think about little corners of your yard where it's okay to leave things a bit messy where you can keep all of your dead leaves or where uh, it's okay to leave uh, dead stems and seed heads um, both as uh, food for wildlife and overwintering habitat for wildlife. And when you start on this native uh, gardening journey, um, you know, I, I was a bit apprehensive about what my neighbors would think. I, I don't live in a neighborhood that has a homeowners association. That might be a, a different ball game. But generally what I found was by being outside a lot in my front yard and tinkering, I think sort of psychologically that reassured people that this habitat was being maintained and cared for. It wasn't neglected or left to grow. And people would always be asking me questions about, you know, what I was seeing, what was flowering. Um, and when, you know, when this rare bird showed up, it turned into a bit of a neighborhood party and uh, everybody came over to see what all the all, all the fuss was about. Um, and during the pandemic, you know, when I couldn't actually um, get out to all the places I'd like to go looking for birds, um, I started really appreciating the birds that were finding their way uh, to my yard. So even though I couldn't travel to see these birds, these birds were traveling through anyway, and then stopping by to pay a visit helped me feel connected to the uh, to the older world. So I, I started a little Instagram page where I uh, posted all of my uh, bird, uh, bird sightings and, and bees and butterflies and such um, in, in the summer. And so just, just to close out, um, I, I wanted to give you a quote from uh, Doug Tallamy, who's a, a scientist and popular science writer, who's very passionate about this idea that um, if we all take a, a little bit of action collectively, even small changes we make um, in, in, our, in our yards and how we manage our landscapes can make a big difference for biodiversity. Uh, so he said that if Americans converted half of their lawns into wildlife habitat, that would comprise more than 20 million acres, which would be the equivalent of um, 10 Yellowstone National Parks. So um, I hope this inspires you, even if you just put in one native flower bed, um, I promise you in a year or two, you'll start to see all sorts of wildlife that perhaps you hadn't appreciated was, was in your neighborhood. So, um, yeah, with that, I'll uh, thank you for your attention and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, the audience. Let's get a question. Question is, where is the page? Oh, uh, <laughs> I tried to make a pun. I, I wanted it, my, my surname's Hall, H-A-L-L. -L. I wanted it to be hologram, like hologram, but that was already taken, so it's rich hologram. So rich hologram. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so that, that's sort of been a fun documentation of, uh, you know, all, all, the, all the different species that have, uh, that, that have shown up. Yeah. I, I have a question. Have yeah. Have you, have you, the music by Rayford Williams, The Lark Ascended. Oh, yes. Since you're British, <laughs> how can you tell us about this bird species? Um, 
So the, the bird species in, in question is the, the, the skylark. So we um, we don't have those natively in the in the US, although there is a, an introduced population on Vancouver Island in, in, in Canada. Um, but um, these are birds that, that sing on the wing, so they um, um, they, they, they sort of fly up from the ground and do these kind of undulating flights while they're singing. Um, they were an iconic sound of, of, of farmland and, um, you know, they, they used to be incredibly common. Essentially, any open land would, would have skylarks. Um, you know, even the marshes in the east of London would have skylarks. Um, but they're one of the species, um, you know, since the 1960s and with um, declines in insects and changes in agricultural practices, um, that's become a much less uh, less frequent um, sound uh, the, these these days. Um, but yeah, a, a gra an iconic grassland bird. Maybe not much to look at, but it doesn't really need to look good when it sounds as as, as good as it does. Yeah. So I have a big back corner that is full of weed, litter, and shrubs and whatever. Yeah. And the one thing I have there you have yet to mention. I have number of snakes that live back there too. Uh -huh. uh, you don't ever get snakes in your yard? I do. Um, mention them. Yeah, I have to say, in you know, in it, my yard is pretty urban, so the main snakes I've seen are um, black rat snakes, which I'm very happy to have around, actually, um, and um, and also brown snakes, the case brown snakes, which are tiny, really cute, like little uh, little insect users. Um, I guess here in the in the coastal plains and in a more natural setting, uh, you know, some of some of the snakes you get might be a little more exciting. Um, but um, you know, I'm I'm always happy to, uh, to 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 have them around. They're a they're a part of um, they're a part of biodiversity. Um, they all have a role to play. They can they can help in, in sort of regulations of, of of rodents and other 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 pests. And and my experience of them, you know, in the Athens area, we do we do have copperheads, for example. Um, and my experience is, you know, provided you you, you give them a respectful uh, distance, I've never really had to. Uh, had to worry about them. Um, if ever there is a situation where where you find there's a, a venomous snake that takes residence in a place you're you're not happy with, like under your you know under your porch or something, um, there's usually somebody that you can you can call. Um, you know, maybe uh, from the Department of Natural Resources or Fish and Wildlife, who would be happy to move that snake. But for the most part. Um, you know, if I if I'm lucky enough to see a snake, I, I generally tend to appreciate it and let it go about its business. <laughs> From online, let's take one. Um, how many gallons of water are in your? Um... Ooh, yeah, that's <laughs> or a good. Just talk about your pool. Yeah, so 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 my my pond setup. Um, I um, I I have a a, a pump, and I, I think it can pump something like, you know, 50 gallons a minute or something at maximum capacity. But I've got a point that I'll, I'll let you do the math on the number of gallons. The, the pond uh, the pond itself is uh, about um, six feet wide. Uh, uh, it's a circular pond, so it's kind of six feet diameter. It's maybe four feet deep at its deepest uh, point. Um, and then I've got the pump that circulates um, uh, circulates the water sort of up an eight eight foot stream, and the stream is you know it's maybe just like half an inch to an inch of um, of, of water in there. Um, if you want to um, you know make those water features maximally attractive to birds, especially some of those birds that spend their time up in the treetops, um, think about um, putting your pond in a place where birds feel comfortable getting down so they don't feel too at risk of, of, of predators. So my pond is kind of uh, underneath the, the sort of low hanging branches of a water oak. Um, and actually some of the fallen branches of that I've kind of used as a bit of yardscaping on the side uh, to create perches for the birds to come down to. And that will help them uh, find it. You don't, you don't have to, if you don't want sort of, if you actually don't want to go the whole hog of having a pond, you can still build these little streams, you can buy something called a pondless waterfall kit, where they'll give you the, the, the pump and the reservoir and the PVC piping. And then I think all you'd need um, would be the landscaping rocks and the, uh, and the planting around it to, uh, uh, to create that. But I was quite happy to have the pond. I have green frogs and leopard frogs in there and um, uh, three lined salamanders breed in the, in the pond as well. So adds another dimension to the wildlife. Are you yeah. using city water or well? 
Um, so uh, it, it was used with City Wall, so, so it's kind of self-contained. Um, yeah, I'll top it up just using using city water. And when I um, when I first put it in, um, you can get these pond starter kits that uh, contain some of the kind of beneficial microbes um, to kind of seed uh, seed the pond. Um, but I find that the the I think the movement of the water it's like constantly sort of aerated. Um, so I've never sort of had. Um, Really, any any issues with with build up of um, algae or or yeah issues with kind of like the water sort of discolored. It seems to it seems to function pretty well. And the only time I really need to um, top it up is um, kind of in the uh, in the summer and fall. Usually, a a good rain is enough to kind of keep it keep it going. Yeah, I wanted to say hello, fellow University of Georgia graduate. Uh -huh. three times over. Why, of course, is what Mr. Odom. Oh my goodness! Wow. Um, but you know that we in the Low Country face um, special challenges. It's a different time or can happen. I guess we authoritatively about as you can. Uh, but the live oaks, for example, yeah. they drop their litter. The magnolias, they drop their leaves. They don't decay very sometimes. <laughs> with the kind of popular trees that people like to plant. And their compatibility with some of the stuff you're talking about. Um, in fact, I would take the question a bit further in terms of species choice, mm -hmm. um, in terms of percent of lawn that gets planted, up area, backyard, yard area that gets planted. Mm -hmm. Birds, we all know, like edges. And um, I noticed your yard has a fair amount of lawn or open area as part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of our new developments say that we can't have trees, very large trees, greater than 35 feet apart. And so that creates a different kind of environment. So I guess I'm arguing for the sun a little bit as part of your planning, because that kind of environment seems to be better for the birds as well as the plants. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, to to a, to a slightly smaller extent, um, I, I do have some trees that, that produce leaf litter that decomposes sort of really nicely. Um, but several of the large trees in my house are water oaks, and so even though you know, even though they're not evergreen, actually the leaves stay pretty like dry and crunchy for, <laughs> uh, for for a very long time. But I have found now with a with a variety of kind of smaller uh, smaller shrubs, things like beauty berries and sweet shrubs, that they they seem to produce a, a nice kind of uh, uh, leaf litter. If you're in a situation where you you can't have sort of uh, tall tall trees. Also, maybe culling some of those leaves would be a good idea. We also get a lot of mosquitoes with a lot of leaves on them, which is another issue. Just not about the birds. Yeah, that says it. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know which mosquitoes are these? Like the, the tiger mosquitoes? Uh, the ruby throated. Oh, no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Interestingly, you know. Um, I used to have a fair few mosquitoes when I first moved to Athens, but actually these, these changes in our climate where we have these sort of protracted periods of multiple weeks without rain, you know, the larval breeding habitat, our, our most pesky urban mosquito is the Asian tiger mosquito, and they actually, you know, they can breed in a thimble of water. They don't really, they wouldn't really want to be in my pond even. They, they like, you know, little tree holes and, um, you know, block gutters and things like that. And we, we found that like a, you know, it dries up enough in the summer. We, we go weeks without mosquitoes because the, the larval habitat disappears um, over, over that amount of time. Um, but yeah, the, the, the moving water helps with that. But yeah, I suppose that there is this there is this tension that in the hottest part of the day, you know, sometimes a mosquito might go to some of these uh, shrubs to uh, kind of hide out in the, in the hottest part. Uh, congratulations on your yard list. 152 is very impressive. <laughs> um, question, where are you on your balance between raised beds and the Georgia clay that, that is your yard? Yeah, so um, so a lot of the stuff is just planted in the um, in, in the red clay. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of the things I, I planted early on, like like York on Holly. Um, I, I just kind of persevered and dug through that, um, and 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 now I've just been putting in the raised beds because um, I'm I'm lazy. Um, 
at least uh, the, the most of the topsoil from that is derived from the compost from the uh, the leaves in the yard that I you know I, I I haven't removed so I have a I have a compost pile and I've been able to sort of see see them there but the uh, the raised beds really it's it's just sort of for that um, that convenience that like at, at, at times of year it's really tough to to get into that. So. My yard was in worse shape than yours before picture. And I'm curious, how long did you did it take before you felt like you'd made a difference? You were working, you didn't do this all at once. Huh? No. <laughs> Um, so, so when you say uh, make a difference, were you talking about in terms of uh, removing any invasives, or when I started to see like an uptick in birds, or you know, however um, you want to? Yeah, because because it it was it was very gradual. You know, the 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 thing the thing about the the humid south where it's almost tropical. You know, some things grow very fast, very We're not quickly. Not talking about cutthroats and invasives. <laughs> no, no, but, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking about some of the asters and sunflowers that, you know, uh, you know, I planted them in the fall and then, you know, the next year they're like eight feet tall and, and, and spreading. So, um, you know, some, some of the, like some of the perennial beds, I, I, I felt like they, they established like pretty quickly, like, a, you know, a year, a year or so after I planted them. Um, Plants like elderberry that that also like as, as a shrub that grew like pretty fast. Um, you know some of the other things I've I've, I've planted like uh, I, I put a black gum in my yard and I feel like that's growing like you know six inches a year or something not 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 very fast. Um, and you know I haven't won the battle against the invasive uh, yards in my neighbourhood have you know bamboo on the side so it's just a question of pushing them to the edges. Um, and um, yeah I. I just, you know, tackle bits of the yard bit by bit by bit, starting closest to the house and sort of working back. It was a student house before I found it. So once I started whacking back the bamboo, I found like a mattress and golf box. <laughs> so it was a very, very interesting experience. <laughs> You've had a question for a while. Is there a hummingbird that stays around here all year round? Um, you can see hummingbirds year round. Um, I suspect it's not the same individual birds. So um, ruby throated hummingbirds are here in the summer. There are a couple of ruby throated hummingbirds that will stick around all winter. Um, but the chances are they they come from from somewhere else, and you've just seen like a changing of the of the guard. But yeah, some some somewhere like um, like Charleston with a pretty like mild winter. Lots of uh, flowers, native and non-native, available. Um, you can see hummingbirds in, in any month. Yeah. Yeah. We have, we have, I have a hummingbird farming farm, and they would sit in the branches when it had snowed a year ago. So they would torture and they had to be flying out to the feeders to feed them. They stayed here year round for at least the last 10 years. Same one. So don't put your feeders away. And these are right. Yeah. So um, yeah, you, you can you can keep um, you can keep feeders out. Um, studies of, of hummingbirds that have been banded have shown um, the feeders aren't. Um, they're not stopping ruby throated hummingbirds migrating. Again, we have our summer ruby throats, and they tend to. Uh, be moving on uh, for the winter, and then others arrive uh, to spend the spend the winter with us. And uh, yeah, a, a, a sugar a sugar water feeder can be um, really useful for them, um, especially during a cold snap. Um, the yeah, the only thing I recommend is you know if you if you feed birds, especially if you feed hummingbirds, uh, please be vigilant about changing out the uh, the sugar water because it can mold. Um, the nice thing about doing doing kind of the native yard is I, I feel like in the summer I, I have enough kind of flowering that the hummingbirds are finding all that they all, all that they need. And I found that like in in Athens, you know, if I left my sugar water out for like three or four days in hot, humid weather, um, it would start to mold. So I kind of just took my feeders down in the summer and I, I put them back up in the in the fall 
when there's lots of hungry um, hummingbirds uh, migrating through. Uh, and then I leave them up in the winter and every once in a while, um, a winter hummingbird will, will, will show up. Can you um, give us some shade plants for birds? Shade plants for birds, yes. Um, so, yeah, my my backyard is sort of part part shade to to full shade. Uh, for the hummingbirds, uh, cardinal flowers grow uh, very very well uh, in the shade. Um, I've actually found beautyberry does like pretty, American beautyberry does like pretty well um, in in the uh, understory um, as as well. Um, yeah, the, the things that grow in my backyard under the oak canopy would, um, yeah, include uh, uh, beauty, beauty berry uh, and, um, you know, the yorpon hollies do fine under the, under the canopy as well, so provide winter interest in berries for the birds. Um, I've got, you know, the, the, the black cherry, the Carolina black cherry. That's not something I planted. It, it found its way into the yard and is, okay. <laughs> is doing re re uh, really well. Um, you have a lot of birds planting yeah. things. <laughs> and yeah, I, I suppose, you, you know, in, in terms of, of, of shrubs and, and, and such, um, they do seem to prefer part, part sun to, to sun. Um, but I have a whole bunch of, um, you know, flowering plants that do like pretty well in the shade. So I've got a lot of um, spring ephemerals like tri trilliums, bloodroots, um, Virginia bluebell. Um, th th there are a whole bunch of um, shade, shade plants. I mean, you know, I, I think the thing to do would be to, uh, you know, go to a website like, um, like Plants for plants Birds because they'll actually say what shade level is tolerated. Um, but yeah, generally I, I've found in, in, in my yard that, um, I've sometimes just tried my luck with uh, plants that are listed as part shade and planted them in an area that I think is pretty shady. And, um, you know, maybe they don't produce the profusion of flowers and berries that they would in a, in a place that they're truly happy, but they still provide that sort of, uh, uh, yeah, like hab habitat structure. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So yesterday I did a set of Orioles hanging out in yeah. the backyard and kind of fly over this dried mealworm thing that I have hanging on the back door. Yep. Can I expect those to hang around to nest or is he just kind of on his way through? Uh, no, they'll they'll spend the winter. Um they 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 don't nest here. If you do see an Oriole in the in the summer, we we have orchard Orioles, um, which which look a, a little bit similar, like a little bit smaller. Um and they they will nest in our area, but these these Baltimore Orioles are just uh winter very uh winter visitors. Um, and there's been this interesting phenomenon of um, birds like Western U.S. birds, um, instead of heading due south into Mexico, they've started coming southeast. So sometimes we'll see birds like Western kingbirds, where here we have a breeding Eastern kingbird in the summer and Western kingbirds are showing up. And um, if you're in a neighborhood that has a lot of Orioles, sometimes people are getting Bullock's Oriole, which is the Western counterpart of the um, of, of the Baltimore Oriole. And um, yeah, not all of the winter hummingbirds are gonna be ruby-throated. You might see something like a, a Rufus hummingbird. Um, and as you mentioned, they can, you know, um, they can actually withstand the cold. They have this mechanism of going into torpor, like slowing their heart rate. Um, physiologically, they can survive the cold, but in those rare events where it gets super, super cold, you do have to be careful about making sure the sugar water doesn't completely freeze uh, solid. Um, I, I bought a little bulb um, that I put on a bungee cord under uh, under under my hummingbird feeder, and that that seemed to do the trick. Yeah. Um, I hate to steal your thunder, but this question is for Charlene. Is it a native <laughs> plant supplier locally here, and has a tip that she'll be setting up with shade grown plants and sun grown plants. When will be your next sale this season, or your first sale, I should say? Sales will begin in early March. Um, we don't yet have anything scheduled for early March, but will happen. But we can check your brand new website, can we? <laughs> Thank you for the plug, Rebecca. <laughs> if you go to www.nativeplantstpp, which stands for um, I have an events page, and right now it's a lot of talks. So I will be giving a talk in April to all of you here. 
um, that I'm going to have to take some bird stuff out of and put more beef and butterflies in the pot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but it's great that then I can broaden the topic. So um, um, that was nativeplantsttp.com, ah. correct? <laughs> yes. Okay, so let's check it out. Plants, well, yeah, uh, thank you. I mean, it's 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 wonderful to have uh, resources where people can, uh, yeah, buy native plants and and learn more more about them. Um, and you know, they they they're just they're just so beautiful. Um, I you know, um, every every spring, I'm always just so happy to see, uh, yeah, what what's what's coming up and, and how the flowers change through the season. And you know, in our parts of the world, you know, spring is. Spring is kind of starting in, in the Athens area. Our first hepaticas are just like poking poking up now, and um, you know by the by the end of this month we'll be seeing blood roots, um, for, you know, leafing out in the woods and stuff. So we're we're lucky to have such a long uh, uh, long growing season, and definitely something to consider as you're you're planting your yard as well, thinking about having color and and, and interest um, and and food for insects and birds that spans a really long season. For the people at home, just so you know, um, they were talking about in the audience that um, the native plant sales will be starting in March in the Low Country, and um, I put on the chat um, someone actually in our audience owns a native plant um, company, Native Plants to the People. So I put that um, link on the chat. Put a plug in the newsletter. Oh yeah, we could put some in the newsletter as well next month. That's a good idea. And one more plug is the South Carolina Native Plant Society um, has a sale where they bring all of the local native plant vendors from the whole region um, to, I believe it'll be Fort Johnson. We're currently setting up that because um, we've been rotating locations. We used to have one permanent location with so many years here, but it will probably be Fort Johnson, um, possibly the last Saturday of March, but that's still up in the air. But if you go to the website, it's a it will be posted within a so look for the South Carolina Native Plant Society. They will be having a sale at Fort Johnson this coming spring. So last weekend in March, maybe? Possibly. Yeah. Possibly. It's not really set yet. So. <laughs> okay. They're meeting Monday to decide. Charlestown Bandit. Yeah. That was that us. Was, oh, that yes. was we are, we are no longer holding them there. We'll it will no longer be at Charlestown Landing. Okay. That's good to know because I've been there for that one. Hey, we got a, another, another question. question. Um, yeah. What other wildlife you see besides birds and insects um, are you going to be attracting in, in, in a garden like yours? Yeah, let's see. So, um, you know, the, um, in the in the leaf litter, so, you know, I, I've used, um, you know, fall, fallen tree limbs to kind of line parts in the, in the yard. And sometimes when I turn those over, I, I'll find, you know, sat salamanders, um, under there, I find uh, I find tree frogs in the in the in the shrubs and and, and trees. Um, find bigger animals. Uh, let's see. I I I don't have turtles in my yard. I mean, you know, it, it all it all depends on um, on context. But yeah, I've I've seen um, you know uh, rabbits, uh, raccoons. Uh, you know, opossums, ah. opossums, armadillos. Um, I am quite lucky that I, I don't have as many white-tailed deer as many other spots in. Uh, I live near a, a pretty uh, major road junction in town, and that seems to... I have seen a deer in the front yard once, but only once, which is a, a, a boon. So my, my, my biggest um, sort of grazer, I think, are these, uh, are these rabbits that you know, sometimes I'll have a, a nice little plant like a Barbara's button. It'll just be about to flower and then, <laughs> but you know, it went, it went to a good home. Um, but yeah, uh, lo lots of insect diversity. Um, uh, yeah, you know, squirrels, chipmunks. Um, and then, yeah, re reptiles like uh, green, green anoles, um, you know, uh, skinks. Uh, yeah, a good a, a good mix, and the, and and you know the the pond has been really good for amphibians, and I also have a couple of of, of breeding uh, dragonfly species in there too. So very good. So we've got pecan, pecan, and oh, pecan. <laughs> Did y'all hear that when he said it earlier? I had to bring that up. So now we have a third one. <laughs> 
<laughs> There's always a debate about whether it's pecan or pecan. Now we've got pecan, pecan. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, um, Richard, thank you very thank much. You. That was how good. Thank you to all. Um, in the audience here and online. Um, and we hope you have a great night and we hope to see you again next month. And we got a oh, door prize. Wait a minute. It's February. Oh, don't forget the oyster rest. Yeah. Door prize. A door prize tonight? Yeah, just give it away. Oh. Okay, I thought it was for the rooster roast. No, no, no. We have a door prize. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to get this thing away. Uh, it's a book. It's a book. I can't take it on the beat at first. <laughs> what do I get to you then? Okay. John Muir's Wild America. All right. Um, there, are about, there, were, there are about 30 people in the audience. I have a number in my head from 1 to 30. How about that? Um, yeah, 17. Quite a lot. 15. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> There's biology jeopardy across all of the clubs. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> thank you again. <laughs> and we have a sign in sheet back on the corner. So if you haven't signed it, you have a minute, please go sign in. <laughs>